Welcome to the next stage of the process that is building a model railway. Design. But before I continue, we have some unanswered questions from the previous episode. Here's an example of each. And while some people swear by end to end, others insist that continuous run is the way to go. So what's the difference between the two types? Well, end to end is as the name suggests, in that you run trains from one end of the layout to the other. Continuous run is also as the name suggests, in that it's essentially a loop of some kind, where trains can complete a loop, can complete a lap of the layout, and then carry on notching up more and more laps. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Advantages of the end-to-end -end layout include it allows for a smaller layout, generally. Generally, they're more compact and at least narrower. Less track is needed, and this can mean that they're cheaper. They're definitely easier to transport, even if you have a really big one. Flexible. They can be made to fit into almost any space. It doesn't have to be a rectangle, it could be an L shape. It can be almost any shape. But there are disadvantages to an end-to-end -end layout, some of them more obvious than others. The fiddle yard can take up a significant chunk of the space available. It can't be used to run trains in. It can be very difficult to run prototypical length trains. It's almost impossible to get trains up to high speed, and trains such as the Pendolino do have a pretty high speed. They generally cruise at a pretty high speed. They tend to focus primarily on shunting and terminus layouts. The variety is usually not as varied as you can get with continuous run layouts. And then when looking at continuous run layouts, it's, the lists are more or less the inverse of the ones we've just looked at. Advantages of the continuous run layout include allowing for the running of trains and locomotives at high speed. They allow for prototypical length trains. You can use a continuous run layout to run locos in. They afford greater layout variety, such as mainline through stations like Crew. You can have huge bridges sweeping over valleys and so on. It's much more difficult, but not impossible, to model such scenes in an end-to-end -end layout. And then of course there are disadvantages to the continuous run layout. Due to them generally being larger and more complex, they tend to gobble up more resources, such as space, money and time. They're also more difficult to transport once built, and even building a modular one uh, to try and make it as transportable as possible can be very, very tricky and complex. Everyone will pick what's best for them, and whilst I probably will do an end-to-end -end layout in the future, such as an exhibition standard one, this layout, my dream layout, is definitely going to be a continuous run layout. This is a tricky one. <laughs> I know of many modellers who have focused on the British Rail years of 1948 to 1965, or 1968 to 1991, when there was basically blue everywhere. I also know of many who are focusing on the 1920s, while some won't touch anything before 2001. And then there's that one guy I met ages ago who models the 17th of March, 1954, on a 27 mile stretch of track, and absolutely nothing else. <laughs> One way to give yourself a lot of flexibility is to base your layout on a heritage line. This means you can run black fives and A4s, such as Mallard, alongside a class 108 DMU, whilst a class 66 brings in some much needed ballast for an extension you're planning. <laughs> Personally, I'm going to carefully model the scenery, buildings and signals on a period sort of between the 1940s and modern day. So in one corner there might be 
some old-fashioned semaphore signals, whilst in the opposite corner there might be some fancy new colour light signals. Placing modern cars in different parts of the layout could mean that on that particular day I'm running something set in 2004. But if I swap all the Ford Focuses and Jaguar XKs for Morris Miners and the odd E-Type, suddenly I can run anything from the 1960s. It's not perfect, and many hardcore modellers would have a heart attack at just the thought, but I don't want to restrict myself too much, you see. So I'm going to focus on sort of between 1975 to 1995 but with the flexibility to run various trains and rolling stock from either side of that period. Well, we have thankfully already answered this question in the previous episode. This dream layout of mine will be built in the green room, which is a good sized upstairs bedroom in my house. Another good question, <laughs> a very, very good question. And to help us, I have come up with a scale. Each and every one of us will fall onto this scale somewhere, depending on how into the modeling you are. You see, for some people, it's just about running trains. Things like ballast, scenery, and even a fiddle yard aren't really important. But at the same time, a giant red train called James, or a wooden one called Sandy, would be far too toy-like. So this would make you probably about a five, which is also where James May would roughly fall. A wooden Brio or plastic Tomy train set would probably be at one or two, whilst an exhibition standard layout using Code 75 track, electro frog points, and modelling a very specific era in a very specific region featuring handmade track and scratch-built buildings would probably be a 10. It's the Goldilocks effect. The toy train sets at 1 and 2 are far too toy-like for my dream layout, but likewise, scratch building everything and making my own track by hand is a little bit too extreme. I would say that I'm roughly a 7. There will be ballasting under the track. There will be a fiddle yard, but I won't have Thomas hauling a rake of nuclear flasks. I'll also be avoiding electrofrog points. I won't be using code 75 track, and I definitely won't be running anything that has a face. It did take a while to decide between electrofrog and insular frog. Because this layout is so big and has so many turnouts, I decided to opt for insular frog. I'm not exhibiting it, I'm not taking it to shows. I just want the trains to run and run really well. I want the layout to be relatively simple to set up and maintain. Electro frog points obviously are more realistic, but they also, they're also quite complicated to wire up. Um, they're also a little bit more money because they cost a little bit more money to, to set up and get working properly. Because of all that, and the fact that my layout has loads of turnouts, I opted for insole frog. But I'll probably do a layout in the future that's entirely electro frog. So it's a case of picking what works best for you. Wow, what a question. There's so many to choose from, with the four major ones being the most popular. So you've got N-Gage, H-O-Gage, double O-Gage, and O-Gage. O-Gage is far too big and expensive for me personally, so it's out. Conversely, N-Gage is a bit too small and fiddly, although it's definitely cheaper than O-Gage. H-O-Gage, at a scale of 1 to 87, is ideal for people modelling American or German trains, for instance. But in Britain, our 200-year-old tunnels and tiny country stations mean that British trains are a bit smaller. To allow the same standard of modelling we see in other gauges, Double O gauge was created, especially for British trains. Even though its scale of 1 to 76 means they're technically a bit too big for the track they run on, the double O standard is now too well established to make way for a more pure scale. Again, it's the Goldilocks effect. As it's not too big, it's not too small, 
has a huge range of models available at affordable prices and is as British as a cup of tea, double O gauge it is. Well, I've grown up in and around LMS and GWR territory, getting accustomed to their design influences that can still be seen in towns and villages to this day. Because of that, I have a keen fondness for LMS and GWR design and architecture, and my layout will be based on an area straddling the English and Welsh border. I've pit the now closed Didcot A power station down in Oxfordshire as the design influence for the power station in my layout. When it comes to deciding where to base your layout, it could be where you've grown up, where you go on holiday, or anywhere that interests or inspires you. Oh, and I'm still waiting to see a desert-based layout. <laughs> when I was a little kid in the 1980s, I remember my dad fitting special sections of track that had breaks in the rails into the sidings so they could be used as isolating tracks. <laughs> These could be hooked up to a switch and operated remotely, allowing you to park a loco in a siding, isolate it from the rest of the layout, and then take control of a different loco, perhaps in a different siding. Thankfully, DCC means we can do all of those operations and more without having to bother with any isolating tracks or banks of switches. However, I will be installing some relays that will allow me to switch any one of the loops from DCC to DC in an instant for the purposes of running in a DC train. Or maybe I'll have just got back from an exhibition with a brand new or very, very old <laughs> secondhand DC locomotive and I might not have any chips, but I might want to run it. So having a hybrid layout and being able to flick between the two Will allow me to run anything at any time. And then with the flick of a switch, back it goes to DCC. I will cover DCC and DC in a separate video, as it's a very important consideration for anyone starting a model layout. Well, there's going to be various construction materials such as timber, insulation board, perhaps the odd bit of medium density fibre board. There's going to be metal screws, bolts, clips, nails. There's going to be copper contacts for electrical conductivity. There'll be some rubber and plastic insulators, washers and grommets, as well as various powders, resins and even real stone for parts of the scenery. This is a biggie. It can be unwise to start construction on a layout you can't afford to finish, but at the same time, this is the hobby of a lifetime, and unless you're trying to meet an exhibition deadline, you can take your time, adding to the layout as and when you can afford it. Okay, like some sort of dodgy builder, I'm going to throw some estimates at you. <laughs> I estimate my layout will take roughly five years to complete, at a cost of between six to ten thousand pounds, and that's not including any rolling stock. But bear in mind, these are estimates. It might take ten years, or it might cost twice as much. The figures do include everything from timber to DCC controllers, and about 200 trees. But spread out over at least five years, this is, personally for me, very affordable. But remember, there's no rush. You do what you can, when you can. It's important to not overstretch yourself, as it's much better to start with something quite small and affordable that you can add to later, than to start with something so big you struggle to make any progress at all. Right, so there we go, all questions answered. And that was tricky, but it had to be done. It's important that that stage was done. And sort of like a, a mission statement or a business plan, answering those questions 
is going to help keep the whole project on track. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I do apologize. Right, so what's next? Well, now that we have answered all those questions and we know what we're doing, I need two things, a pencil and a tape measure. This train terminates here. Please ensure that you take all your belongings with you when you leave the train. Thank you for traveling with us today.